Okay, I think we'll go ahead and get going. Um, so my name is Beth Groakes and I work for IBM as an open source engineer. I'm actually lucky enough to get to spend about half my time at work contributing to the Node.js core and other parts of the Node.js ecosystem. The rest of my time, my team's kind of focused on deployment techniques for Node.js applications and how you can build cloud native Node.js apps. And I'm also a Node.js technical steering committee member. I'm mainly active within the Node.js release team. And I don't know if you all know, but Node 10, 10 this year. So it was originally created in 2009. And with it being its 10th birthday or anniversary, whatever you'd like to call it, I thought it'd be a good time to cover a little bit of the history and also go through what's new in the latest versions of Node and all of the activity that's currently going on in the project. So if we go back to where it all started, okay, uh, so Node.js was first created by Ryan Dahl in 2009. And he actually recorded a video um, titled The History of Node.js, where he mentions he feels Node.js primarily stems from trying to solve the upload progress bar problem. So back in 2009, he was looking for a good way you could work out how much of a file had been uploaded to a server. And at the time, the kind of techniques people were using were iframes or sending small AJAX requests to the server and saying how much has the file been uploaded and the server coming back and stating how much had been uploaded. But that was quite costly in terms of how many requests you're having to send just for a loading bar. There was another technique called long polling. And the long polling technique works by uh, when a request is sent, the server won't actually respond until something significant had changed. So in the case of a file, uh, file upload, um, you'd send a request and the server wouldn't come back unless the file had actually changed in size on the server. And he actually started to think, hey, I should build a web server or a framework that is optimized for this kind of long polling technique where the server doesn't always have to respond immediately. And he actually originally tried to solve the problem in Ruby. So he cried, tried to create a project um, that optimized the long polling technique in Ruby. But he was actually held back in terms of speed when using Ruby. He then tried with C. So he wrote a, a, pro a project implementation in C. But he couldn't actually gain much traction around the C implementation because it, it wasn't cool, it wasn't new, and people just weren't that interested in it. Um, and eventually he realized JavaScript was the way to go because web developers were already using JavaScript and the kind of uh, techniques and what Node.js was going to be created for aligned perfectly with the current web developers who are using JavaScript. And by about March 2009, he'd named his project Node. And he actually introduced it to the world at JSConf EU in Berlin, and the thesis of his talk was that I.O. needed to be done differently. So Ryan introduced it in brief as server-side JavaScript, built on Google's V8 engine, evented non-blocking I.O., using a common JS module system. And back then, it was just 8,000 lines of C or C++, um, 2,000 lines of JavaScript, and there were just 14 contributors. And this was one of the first little snippets he used to introduce people to the non-blocking nature of Node.js. So I'm sure it's very similar to, well, it is for me, how I first learned how Node worked. 2009, uh, NPM was also created uh, as a package manager for Node.js. And the reason, the motivation for the project was for JavaScript developers to easily be able to share package modules of code. And unsurprisingly, around the same time, we saw the birth of Express and Socket.io. So these are two very popular frameworks that go as far back as 2010. And Express, the web framework, I'm sure you've heard of it, was actually originally inspired by Java's, uh, sorry, Ruby's Sinatra framework. And it still gets in excess of 10 million downloads a week, so it's still very popular. Uh, and Socket.io used for building real-time web apps. Six months later, we we're already seeing clouds um, cloud providers like Heroku coming out saying, hey, you can deploy Node.js in our cloud. And this is all while Node was still at version 0 
And also 2011, we started to see large companies coming out saying, hey, we've, we, we're using Node.js and these are the benefits we're finding from using it. So LinkedIn in particular, they published a blog saying, hey, we converted our existing Ruby web app to Node and it's, it's much faster, it's cost us a fraction of the resources and the development time was much faster. So we're still only at 063, we've got large companies using Node in production, we've got cloud services. Node 063, the interesting thing about this release, it's the first one that bundled NPM. And 2012, we saw Happy. So Happy was actually created as a server framework by Walmart. And their motivation to create this project was to um, build an, a, a framework that could help them deal with their scaling uh, requirements around Black Friday sales. So they actually built a framework bespoke to tackle that problem. We saw more frameworks, there's a bit of theme here. So we saw Kraken, where they actually extended Express um, with some enterprise level features. Uh, Koa, uh, Koa was actually made by the original author of Express, but with the name of being a bit more modular and expressive. And also we started seeing a lot of references to mean stack applications in 2013. So grouping MongoDB, Express, Angular, and Node together as a set of technologies. In 2014, I'm sure many of you remember or are aware, uh, the project was forked as IOJS. There are many reasons for this, um, but two, the two main ones I think were there was a desire for faster moving and more frequent releases. So at the time, the releases weren't progressing particularly quickly. And also a desire for more open governance. So people wanted the project to be governed by an open body. And in 2015, that's when the Node Foundation was established. So the Node Foundation was to be that neutral and open body to govern Node.js. And lots of large enterprises came together to establish this. And by Q1 of that year, they set a reconciliation proposal so that the IO and Node.js projects could merge back together underneath the Node.js Foundation. And that was done by Q2 of 2015. And that's actually when Node 4 was released. And this was the first fully converged IO, JS, and Node.js release. So the reason it went straight from 0 to 4 is because IO had versions 1, 2, and 3. So when it all merged back together, it merged back as Node 4. And it was also the first release that was to follow an LCS policy. And that meant that Node 4 would be supported to, for up to 30 months. And we still follow that same LTS policy today. So Node.js follows semantic versioning. We have two major releases per year. And the even numbered releases uh, graduate to LTS status, where they're supported for up to 30 months. And this LTS policy was vital for large enterprises to start to adopt Node, because a lot of them still have um, long update schedules or things like that. So giving them time to migrate between release lines without having to deal with breaking changes is fundamental to them adopting it. 2015, the foundation was still growing. We saw Yahoo, Rising Stack, Apogee joining. We also had the first Node.js Interactive. So that was in Portland, Oregon. There was about 700 people there. And hot topics at the time were Internet of Things and debugging Node in production. In 2016, Express joined the Node.js Foundation uh, un, as an incubator project. So the Node Foundation had a program called the Incubator Program, where uh, popular projects or frameworks can be brought in under it and receive assistance or governance mentorship. The reason Express was brought in is because it's so popular and critical to the ecosystem. As I mentioned, it's still getting in excess of 10 million downloads a week. And because it's so critical for a large por portion of Node users, it was important to bring it in under open governance. And 2016, we also saw Node 6 be released. Uh, this came with fast and module loading, a uh, new buffer API. So this was to try and tackle some of the pitfalls we were seeing with the um, original buffer API. Uh, math random improved security and a lot more ES6, fe ES6 features. 2016, you might remember the left pad incident. This was one of the highlights of the year. Um, 
Left pad was uh, heavily dependent on module in the ecosystem. You probably weren't requiring it directly, but it could be pulled in at some point up in your tree. And it was unpublished by the author from NPM. And this caused many people's NPM installs, whether that's when they're running them to deploy their production applications, uh, to fail with like 404 not found because it had been unpublished. NPM quickly restored the package, but um, the surprising thing at the time is it was just 11 lines of JavaScript that padded a string that caused all these problems. And I think this was really when the issues around dependency management and usage in Node.js really started to be highlighted. Unsurprisingly, Yarm was released that same year. So Yarm was a collaboration between Facebook, Exponent, Google, and Tildy. And it was trying to tackle some of the problems they were seeing with dependency management, particularly around security, consistency, and performance. In 2017, uh, NEMPI was created. And this is for those who are writing um, exist, uh, native modules, um, which are C, C++ that talk to uh, the V8 or underlying VM. And what NEMPI allows is, is like an interface layer between. And this means that every time V8 changes, you don't need to uh, edit your native module. Or, and in most cases, you won't need to recompile if you build against this NAPI kind of abstraction layer. And the work on this actually came about from Chakra Core, which was Microsoft's uh, VM engine, and a way to have a layer that's neutral to which underlying VM you're using, so whether it's V8 or Chakra Core. And in 2017, Node 8 was released, and this came with async hooks API. So if you haven't used that, it kind of lets you track the asynchronous um, work that's going on in your application. It's the first LTS release with async await unflagged. NEPI was included in that release. Util Promisify, so allowing you to wrap callback APIs into promises. And what working group URL parser. And as a kind of public service announcement, no date goes end of life uh, less than three weeks today, uh, after which time there will be no security fixes or updates. Uh, this is actually four months earlier than it should have been according to the LTS schedule. And the reason it's slightly shorter is because the version of OpenSSL 1.0.2 actually goes end of life in December. So we had to bring nodes end of life earlier for that. 2017, so this is a slide from JS Interactive's keynote in 2017. So it's really showcasing the mass adoption of Node.js. So almost 9 million node instances, 1,500 com contributors, and that's up from just 14 in 2009. Uh, and I think it's 3, 3 million or 3, bill 3 billion package downloads a week from NPM. In 2018, Node 10 was released. So any API was declared stable in this release. We had stable HTTP2, an experimental FS promises API. So this is so you can use all the like read file operations via promises instead. And we got an update to V8, which included async generators. Node 10 will, be, will still be supported up until April 2021. So you've still got some time if you're on that release. And up to this year, very early on in the year, there was an intent to merge the JS foundations and the Node.js foundation. And the reasoning behind this was that they could streamline the operational parts of running foundations or the overhead of managing this foundation body. Uh, and also, we could work together on complementary goals. So by around Q1, Q2, we were merged back together. And at the moment, we've got around 30 active projects underneath the foundation includes things like uh, Node-RED, uh, Node, NVM, et cetera, and 26 member companies. So these are companies that uh, sponsor the OpenJS Foundation. It's also the year we hit a million NPM packages. So as you can see, it followed the like, exponential growth we'd expected. And that's actually more than double the, uh, the next highest uh, dependency registry, which is Maven Central. And in April of this year, Node 12 was released. Uh, it entered LTS in October, so you're good to use it in production. And if you are looking to upgrade, aim for Node 12, because that will buy you the most time in terms of support lifetime. And 
goes end of live April 2022. And to look at a few of the features in Node 12, so Node 12 came with faster await, faster JSON parse, and that's all via the V8 upgrade to V877. So V8 are always working on how they can improve speed and efficiency. And as we pick up their updates, we get to leverage those performance benefits in Node. It also came with async stack traces. And if you haven't seen these, um, I'll give a quick walkthrough. So imagine you have a async function foo that awaits another async function bar that just throws a new error. In node 11 and under, you would just see, hey, bar function throws an error at line nine. And then you'd see all these internal um, processes on the stack trace. But in node 12, what you will now see is it will async foo. So it actually tells you where that function was called from. This helps you track where things actually went wrong and helps you read what sometimes is a mess of hopping around which function calls which. Another feature that I particularly like that came via the V8 upgrade was the promise to all settled. So the difference between promise to all and promise to all settled is that when you have an array of promises that you pass to promise to all, the second one fails it will short circuit and won't run any of the rest or complete any of the rest. Promise.all settled will wait until every promise completes, ignoring whether they reject or pass. So if you have some work that needs to be done, um, regardless whether it passes or fails, you should, that's a use case for Promise.all settled. We also got an update to ES6 module support. And uh, this is currently exper experimental in Node 12, so you have to pass the experimental modules flag to the Node process to use it. Um, and this includes um, things such as uh, import export statements uh, supported in JavaScript files. Um, you should check out the blog by the Node Foundation. Um, it covers the modules working groups plan for how they're going to implement ESM in Node. I believe there is hope that it will be unflagged at some point in the lifetime of 12, but it's still in, in debate at the moment. Another feature is the, in Node 12 was the diagnostic reports. This is also experimental, behind the flag experimental report. And if any of you have worked with Java before, this kind of provides you a thing a bit like a Java core file. So, when there's a crash or an error, it will produce you a report that will provide you information to help you diagnose things like crashes, slow performance, memory leaks, CPU usage, et cetera. And it was actually um, an external module before it was uh, brought into Node Core. And the PR to merge it into Node Core is, had like almost a thousand comments. I think it's one of the most commented on PRs. The reason it was brought in as a from an external module into Node Core is to support adoption because you kind of have to have these reports generated when your app crashes because there's no use having to, some, to restart your process and install it and then hope that the same behavior is seen again. So if it's there by default, people can actually more easily use it. There is a talk at, um, today at 2.20 going into the when to use these diagnostic reports by Garish, uh, who actually created PR to merge in. Some of the other features in Node 12. Um, so the default um, HTTP parser was swapped to LLHTTP, HTTP. And this was due to maintenance concerns around the origin, original HTTP parser. We also got an upgrade to NPM, and it will continue to get upgrades. And TLS support. So the default max protocol is now TLS 1.3. And work threads are now stable. I think there's a talk today about worker threads, but they're now stable to use. You can use them in production and you can use them in LTS. Also in October 2019, um, Node 13 was released. So this release will be never promoted to LTS. And the purpose of odd numbered release lines is for you to really try out new features, um, play around with um, what's new and, and also test out whether you've got any breakages between versions. So if you've got some code running with Node 12, see if it still runs with Node 13. If it already breaks, then it's something to look at in advance of you needing to upgrade. 
And there was actually just 43 um, breaking or some of the major changes in Node 13, which is actually the lowest of any major release we've had. And to look at some of the key features, the main one I think to call out is Node 13 builds with full ICU by default. ICU stands for International Components for Unicode, and it's used to provide internationalization in Node. And this means out of the box, hundreds of locales are supported. There is a trade, there was a trade off between binary size. So binary size between Node 12 and 13 will increase. But this means that we've got so many um, locales supported out of the box, we, we decided it was worth the increase. And as an example, before, if you tried to call out the current month, um, it would have just printed the English string, whereas in um, Node 13 Plus, it would actually pr print out the correct string for the locale that you're specifying. Other new features um, include unflagged updated ECMAScript module support. So this is the same support that might be unflagged in Node 12. And also, very recently, we got in the initial experimental WASI support, so the WebAssembly system interface, and also V8 got updated to V879. And if we look at 2019 in numbers, we've actually reached uh, 2,620 contributors. Uh, we've got 108 active collaborators. Collaborators are people who are nominated for their either continuous or significant contributions to the Node.js project. That's not, um, not specifically code contributions. That could be help with docs, or it could be help with maintaining our build servers, etc. And it's the collaborators that review all the PRs, merge all the PRs, um, start the CI runs for every single pull request. Then we've also had 3,600-odd pull requests this year. 1,650 issues, and that's just on Node.js Node, so not in the other repos that Node has, like Node.js Help. And we've had over 50 releases. Keeping up with all of this activity is a huge task. A lot of it's done by the collaborators, but we also have several working groups. The working groups are kind of task forces for particular areas of the project, and they have responsibilities over that area of the project. So the various ones we have streams, uh, look after our streams implementations, build, so build, look after all of our machines, diagnostics, internationalization, Docker, so the Docker working group uh, maintains all of our images up on Docker Hub. Uh, the add-on API, so all the work around providing that native module abstraction layer. Benchmarking, release, so building all the releases and determining and auditing which features should go into which releases and also the security working group. So keeping track of all the vulnerabilities and making the call of when we need to cut security releases. And I'd like to do a very special shout out to the Node.js build working group. They're really not visible in the project, but without them, we wouldn't be able to build releases. We wouldn't be able to land PRs. We wouldn't, like, every, you wouldn't be able to download Node. They maintain the server where you pick up your Node downloads from. And I quite like this picture, it's actually a bunch of pies we have running in one of our collaborators, Rod's basement in Australia. And this runs all of our CI testing on ARM. So it's quite nice. And yeah, the Node.js build working group, they maintain our Jenkins CI server. They maintain our build server. And the kind of work they're doing day to day is making updates to our Ansible playbooks to install which dependencies we need on which machines. Um, we got over 200 machines for them to maintain, 50 OS slash Arch combinations across build and test. So we, yeah, they definitely kind of unsung heroes of the project. And if anyone has any interest in maintaining machines or Ansible playbooks, uh, come chat to me and I'll get you involved because they, they're definitely down to just a few people maintaining all of this for us. Most of them are volunteering their time to do this. We also have a bunch of donors who've donated all of our infrastructure, so I thought I'd just say a big thank you to them, because without them, we wouldn't have the machines to run all of our CI, et cetera, on. And if you want to get involved, um, you should check out nodetodo.org. So what node to do does, it guides you through how you can build Node from source and um, then make your first contribution into Node. 
And the way it does it, it will point you to our code coverage tool where you can identify a line of code which isn't covered and then it will try and help you write a test to cover that line of code. So at the same time as you're getting your first contribution into Node, we're also improving our code coverage, which is great for everyone. It's actually run by Richard Trott, who will be around the conference. Um, but if you're also interested in getting involved with any other parts of the project, um, come chat to me or anyone else uh, at the IBM booth, because we're all contributors and we can find an area of the project that might be interesting for you. And yeah. And if, if you were to ask what's next in Node, uh, the things that happen in Node are the things that people put the effort in to work on. So, if, so it's really, if, if you see a pull request open saying, hey, I'm playing around with this, and you think that feature sounds good, the more people do get behind that PR and start commenting and start showing an interest, the more likely it is for that support to actually go through. Um, the kind of areas at the moment that we're looking at is quick support. So I think there's a talk at the conference on quick and HTTP free. And we also have some strategic initiatives around uh, workers, worker threads, and also updating all of our Python support to use Python free, because we're not quite there yet and we're running out of time. Um, yeah, if, if you're interested, there's also a community corner at the conference, I've not found it yet myself, where we'll be having open office hours, where each of the working groups will kind of be there for an hour for you to ask any questions, be that about releases or streams or anything in particular. And I hope that was good, but thanks for listening to my talk. Bye.